Let's go back to 1939. Let's pick up the film right here at Mandalay, uh, uh, Joan Fontaine in the motion picture, Rebecca. Here it comes. Now here is Joan Fontaine, and you said when you came out what a terrible thing I did by showing that clip of... What do you think when you see yourself in that picture, 21... Or, well, I, well, I never go if I can help it, but occasionally people sneak something over on me like this one. That's very painful. First of all, you feel your, your own daughter, in a sense, watching yourself. And I remember I had to see the constant nymph at the Museum of Modern Art once. <laughs> I'm in a museum already. And it was, <laughs> I kept trying to say, don't do it. Don't get off that screen. Go home, have babies, live in the country, go on a farm. Don't but, do it. But what a tremendous part of your life that picture was, huh? Oh, it was a marvelous thing for, I was 21 when I got it. And to have somebody back you up, like David Selznick, and have a studio behind you, to have the whole studio mechanism, as it were, mm -hmm. which gives you a firm footing in, in that old stardom racket. Whereas I think it's awfully hard for young people today who are starting out because there's no continuity to their careers. They haven't got a producer and a presario. Right, who plans, now you'll do this, exactly. now you'll do this, now you'll do that, right up the line. And, and probably it. Laurence Olivier was thrilled to have you in that picture. No, he wasn't. He wanted Vivian Lee. You're kidding. <laughs> oh, no. Indeed, he did and said so. And Hitchcock used to uh, say, come on, kid, I'm rooting for you, but uh, you're on your best behavior. You're, you may get replaced. It was an awful feeling. But was I think there, it helped me. Was there ever a time during the picture where you're continuing it was really in doubt that Olivier wanted you off and Vivian Lee yeah, in? It was the first week or two. Mm -hmm. Would he tell you that? Well, not exactly, but, um, you know, the, as I say in my book, No Better Roses, the, the English stick together. I'm English, too, by the way, but they're a very close corporation, and uh, Vivian yeah. and Zary were part of the English colony, and, of course, they wanted their Viv to be in it, and uh, then I've worked with all those English people many times, Gladys Cooper and all those other people, and uh, either you are or you aren't, and that was it. When this picture was made, Hitchcock's reputation wasn't the reputation that the man enjoys today. He just started. That's correct. What was he like then, working for him as a director when he was just beginning in this country, really? Well, he was darling. I adore Hitchcock. He, I think, felt uh, a little bit uh, not quite the same as the rest of the actors on in a social strata, but he's a knight now. Yeah. <laughs> it's Sir Alfred. Isn't that lovely? Uh -huh. I'm thrilled for him. But in the years intervening, he, he said, all actors are cattle. Did he treat you like cattle? Yeah, that was just That's all fun. part of his, yeah. Yes. When you talk about the days of the studios and people like Selznick, who planned your careers, how much did they rule by fear? That you better do this or else. Not only by fear, but uh, command, as you just said. You would get these enormous telegrams if you didn't do what they wanted you to do of, of total revilement. And you are ungrateful, and where would you be if it weren't for me, and you don't know how fortunate you are. And very often they would put things in the press, which was very disturbing, because um, you would read that you were out at a nightclub when your husband was doing something else. And all this, which wasn't true, 
But no, it no, wait, could who, be there. Who, who would put that in the columns? Well, the studios. Let me yeah. just say the studios. Maybe the press departments of the studios. But that was a way of disciplining you, a way of holding you in order and check, as it were. Luella Parsons used to be quite a medium for some of the studios who would plant things through her columns to make the actors, directors, writers, whatever it happened to be, toe the mark. What about, as long as you bring it up, because I was going to get to Luella Parsons and Hedda Hopper and those powerful women who wrote about the Hollywood stars and your dealings with them. Well, you write about them in uh, No well, Better what Roses. What was so interesting to me was the payola, as it were, the Christmas presents. And I think I say in my book that I went to visit Hedda Hopper one day and she had great big jars, bottles of uh, Chanel number no. 5 and whatever the perfumes were. And I said, good heavens. She said, oh, the studio send me these all the time. I just mix them together and have my own. <laughs> Literally. And would, uh, would, uh, would uh, uh, Luella? Luella get presents too? Well, the, the one that I love, I, I don't know if it's true or not, but it had gone around Hollywood, so I published it, was that at Christmas, she would go to a uh, Christmas party and the driver, and they would load the station wagon up with all kinds of presents. And when I say presents, I mean alligator suitcases. Are you kidding oh, me? Oh, furs, linen, silver. Over, uh, champagne, everything you can possibly imagine. So this one time she came out after the party and her station wagon was absolutely robbed. So she went home and uh, the day after Christmas her secretary let all the studios know that the station wagon was coming oh, back God. again. <laughs> and Come please on. fill it up. Yes, <laughs> You indeed. have got to be kidding. Isn't that marvelous? You know, that still goes on with critics. I know for a fact that there are some critics in this country, and I, you know, it's, I can't tell it now, but when I do my book 50 years from now, God willing, I can say their names. Some of the most pompous critics in this country are supplied video cassettes of the television shows by the stations sent to their home. Most of the schleppers, you know, they get hauled into the studio, but the high mucky mucks, the cassettes are sent right at home so they don't have to leave home ever, you know. So I often wonder about these Simon Pure critics, uh, whether they be named Luella Parsons or somebody else. Well, I've been out with a lot of critics who first nights, and I do know that sometimes they're cross at the taxi driver or something else, and it comes out on the play in their review, whatever their mood happens to be, mm -hmm. or whether mm -hmm. they um, were badly served at Saudis or wherever we've been. They all want to know why you don't get along with your sister. Uh, it's very simple. And that is, when I was born, I made that one mistake of getting born in the wrong family. I like my mother, <laughs> but uh, my sister uh, resented me tremendously, so my mother told me. Would not come near my crib. So I don't take it personally at all. I could have been a, a boy or a puppy or whatever it was. I intruded in her life. And I've talked to psychiatrists about that, and they say that it's not unusual at all that this often happens with the eldest uh, in the family, and since there are only two, she's just the elder, and that made it even more difficult. Do you enjoy saying that, that what? she's the elder? Not particularly. Okay. No, she's not much older than I am. She's only 15 months older. Doesn't make any difference. I like okay. getting old anyhow. Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm enjoying it. Okay. Oh, sure. Uh, but anyway, um, so the fact that I became an actress, too, didn't probably help much, but still, that's what it is. And uh, at, our age is now. There is no hope for her to change her attitude at all. So I'm used to it. I'm going to pursue this a little bit, Joe. Yeah. And, 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 and if you want me to stop, you'll tell me to Don't stop. Care. I mean, would you want to go to your graves not speaking to each other and not getting along? Well, we never have. Why should we start now? Why change things up? <laughs> you forget what the original source of the disagreement was very often. With a lot of people, it just doesn't have to be sisters or siblings. It can be husband and wife, for that matter. How many novels have you read where the husband and wife never spoke to each other at dinner table and the poor kids had to sit around? You know that. Make small talk, huh? <laughs> now, what about, you just said that you enjoy growing older. I just love it. It's mine. When did you start? You don't believe me. Yeah, I I, no, I do. Oh. I, can, no, I can see in your eyes that you do. It's such, it's so marvelous. You've got everything to yourself. <laughs> it's a very selfish attitude. But we've had the children and the marriages and the whole thing. And now I've got my life to myself to lead as I want to without having to consult anybody or take care of anybody else or be responsible to anybody else. I make my own mistakes. Mm -hmm. Nobody can blame me. Mm -hmm. Except myself. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of nice. How did you like doing uh, Eleanor in... Uh... 
Oh, I women. love that woman. She's a fiery, crusty old dame. Independent lady like Ooh, you. Oh, yeah. boy. And a warrior. And I'm a fighter, too. So it was just grand. Very funny. I was uh, interviewed the other day for a part, and somebody said, how could you play Eleanor of Aquitaine? Because you have always played those little English girls. Well, that's kind of an insult. An actor is an actor. After all, you should be able to play all a, a wide range of characters. If you're an actor, character. yeah. yeah. Yes, and I think I have enough Irish in me to... You were being interviewed for a part? They interview you for a part? Well, well, yes, but that was through a friend wanted me to go and sit down and talk about something, but I couldn't do it anyway. Do you work that much anymore? Do you want to work that much anymore, or do you have other projects? I worked nine months last year. That's an awful lot. And I'd like to do a play a year and something else. But I like to be independent. I like to be financially independent. I naturally have an income from all these years, but I don't like to spend that. I like to make myself go out and say, Joan, you're going to earn that money if you want to do this, and you want that, and you want a trip, and you want to play golf, and you want to do that. Go ahead and earn it. Don't touch your capital. So I do, and it's a wonderful impetus. I'm told you don't like to talk about politics. I had my passport taken away from me, Tom, and that was very, I'm a naturalized citizen, my English by birth. And when that happened, Thank God I knew some people in Washington, so I did get it back. But I often have thought what somebody who didn't have any connections might do. It would be a terrible thing. And I resolved, and I'm very political, and I have very strong opinions, but I'm not going to voice them because I saw what could happen. And another thing, in the days when there was the studio system, oh, if you, you were a Republican or you were a Democrat, the head of the studio was one or the other, but probably not what you were. Therefore, you automatically had his disfavor. Yeah. And it was a bad thing to do, to take a political side. I don't mean from a standpoint of cowardice. I will speak out if I have to. Mm -hmm. But I just think it is not smart to be too public about your political opinion. I'm still hazy on why your passport was lifted. Was it something you said? I belong to, as many of us did, thousands of us did, uh, what we call HICAS, Hollywood Association for Arts, Sciences and Professions, which was headed by Mrs. Roosevelt and Joe Davidson, the sculptor, for some reason that was suspect eventually. And uh, a friend with the FBI came to me and said, get out of it. So I did. I'd only gone to four meetings. But my dear, it was something like eight years later that they took the passport away. Six or eight years. I mean, that is incredible. Yet you were friendly with Adlai Stevenson, weren't you, a politician? Yes. Did you like him? I wish we had more like him. I wish we had somebody today with his integrity and his ability to speak and his sense of the tact and diplomacy. And I can't recall now because man. I was really too young to know that much about political campaigns when he was running for president in the 50s. But were you a supporter of his? Did you declare for him or anything? Or you never? I didn't declare for anybody, ever. I just learned not to. Both on the screen <laughs> and <laughs> off. Now, like, when your marriage has ended, did you get alimony? Never. Why not? Never asked for it. I, I don't think I would have had a chance in the first place. Being a woman earning my own money, what judge is going to give me any alimony? I'm probably earning sometimes more than my husband's were, so there was no way. Uh, nor, nor for child support. You couldn't, I'm sure, get that. I think there was some nominal school thing, but that's... How do you feel about the concept of alimony is what I really want to ask you. Well, I think if a woman has uh, had children by a man, and they must have the woman at home, the mother should stay at home and look after those children. Yes, indeed, she should be taken care of, and she shouldn't be abandoned when the children are grown up. She must have somebody to, some money to support herself for the rest of her life. Mm -hmm. It's too late to go out and find a job at 50, or whenever the children have gone, 40 perhaps. Uh, absolutely necessary. But if a woman is self-supporting and does not have children, there is no reason why she should ever have any alimony at all. Hello, girls, but I'm, I really don't feel that it's fair. How about this new trend now where they want the alimony even though they aren't married? If the woman is staying home and being the housekeeper and putting your suits out and uh, arranging your dinner parties and uh, writing your thank you notes and doing all that, yes, she's a guy, she has a job. She should be paid for a job. What do you think of the whole concept of morality in this country today, things that are going on? I mean, we're both of a different time, and uh, I sometimes wonder if this country is a little isn't different going. than you. Yeah, well, <laughs> oh. well, I I think it's much more sensible. You know, uh, my mother was very Victorian, so one got terribly knotted up as a young girl. You were not allowed to hold anybody's hand, yeah. even. Yeah. So by the time 
you are married as a woman in my day uh, and have uh, no experience, it's a terrible shock to you. And how can one adjust? A man has probably had experience in that field, but not a woman. And I should think the uh, whole uh, violence of it, is, as a matter of fact, would be terrible for a woman. And, uh, the wedding you? night in the Victorian age when the girl didn't even know what was going to go on, had no idea, wasn't even told. Let alone what's going to come off. Huh? Well, you know what, what Roosevelt's father said on his wedding eve? Uh -uh. Franklin Roosevelt, his father took him to study after dinner and he said, young man, now you're going to be married tomorrow and there's a subject which, um, which, uh, well, uh, even um, fathers don't discuss with their sons <laughs> and didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so you think it's a little more honest today? Oh, sure. What was morality like in the Hollywood that you were a part of back well, then? Well, it was supposed to have been wild, but I never saw it. I think the wildest thing I ever saw was a few people diving into his pool with all their clothes on, but none of that. And of course, it was... I didn't even see the drug scene, any of that ever. No casting couches? There certainly were casting couches, uh -huh. and you had to be fleet of foot, too. Indeed, you do. I rather amuse that the casting couch in Hollywood today is not supposed to be a lure for the girls. It's the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> you are a devil. Yes. So now, what are you doing for the next couple of months? For the next couple of months, I am doing a soap. I've never done one in my life. Afternoon drama. Yep, I'm doing Ryan's Hope, and uh, I learned when I was in Vienna that you have to keep active in various spheres. So I do the theater, and I do TV and various things. So I thought, well, let's have a look at this, the soap audience for a while and see what that's like. Mm -hmm. uh, You'll have fun with that. I quite possibly will. And what's neat is that you don't think it's beneath you or you don't want to do it. Or, I mean, you want to do that. I want to do it, and I lecture a great deal, and I meet a great deal of other kinds of women that I had not met before. And one lovely thing about lecturing is that in, for years, behind the camera, you never met anybody. You mm -hmm. only met the Hollywood people that were involved in that. You never met the public, as it were. But now, to be able to go, and I find that so many women have had the same problems I have. It's like <laughs> I'm going to make a funny joke. It's like meeting a whole lot of sisters. <laughs> 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 Only these talk to me. <laughs>